Hi, Stacy. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. So um, while many people are body psychotherapists, you have a little bit more of an emphasis on body based on your prior profession. Mm -hmm. I do, I do. I started my career originally in the interest of psychology, but ended up in exercise science first. Mm -hmm. And then it was um, seeing the, the connection between what was happening on the fitness center floor, knowing metabolically or scientifically it should all be working out. And it wasn't because something in the psychology was getting in the way of, say, weight loss or some metabolic change like lowering blood pressure. And a lot of my clients kept crying. They would cry. And my colleagues would say, oh, your client's try crying again over on the treadmill. And I realized I needed some more skills. And there was something about what I was able to do with them, ask them, be present to that allowed them to open up differently. And at that point they would almost always reach physical goals. So I went back to school and ended up in the world of psychology mm -hmm. and then found my way to somatic psychology because it's the one that fit the best with what was happening on the exercise floor. Yeah. 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 And so today um, we talked a little bit uh, before in terms of what we're going to cover mm -hmm. and instead of an unstructured interview, unstructured conversation, uh, we came up with a plan of four topics that we're going to cover in order to share with people who listen to this uh, the sense of how you work and why you work that way. So maybe you want to share what these four topics are before we go into detail? Yeah. So... Um, we're going to start with talking a little bit about what heart rate variability is and how that connects into the nervous system, because that's a big key piece of understanding how things all come together and those different elements of how we use the different parts of the body to drive down into what movements are needed. Then look at exercise and therapy. How do we actually use the movement themselves and what does that movement mean? mean in the therapy room and how does that help shift as well as um, then looking at maybe some specific diagnoses and or some specific treatment ideas and then how the therapist actually uses their body as part of the treatment as well. Great, great. So let's go to the first one and uh, talk about heart rate and heart rate variability and the nervous system. So when you look at heart rate and heart rate variability, um, part of so in the exercise world, heart rate is a big deal. It tells me how hard they're working. It helps me understand metabolically what's happening so that I can manipulate the systems, whether that be, say, overloading with weights or with speed or force or something, to change the way the body is engaging with that movement, which then allows the body to expand somehow, some way. So maybe my cardiovascular system gets stronger or I build more muscle fiber or something like that. I might have to utilize fat stores and as a Result, I lose weight. So when I'm looking at heart rate from an exercise science point of view, I'm manipulating that as a way to manipulate the workload on the body and offer the stress load. So the heart rate is actually controlled by the nervous system. And it goes back and forth between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, depending on where you are in the breath rate, which is signaling to the heart how to beat. And so when we're looking at the heart rate and what's in between the beats, the interbeat, we can see how, where their nervous system is. And so um, I think this is not going to be any news to anybody. The faster your heart rate, the more sympathetic you're going to be. When you breathe in, you actually close off the piece to the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic turns on for a moment. When you breathe out, the, the parasympathetic is in control. And the parasympathetic actually modulates the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is tied to the heart rate. So when I take a breath, I'm controlling my heart rate, which when we think about all the different breathing activities we have for people, part of what we're doing is manipulating their nervous system. And we're manipulating it through the breath rate, which then controls the heart rate, which then controls what's happening in the nervous system. And so um, it is a constant measure. The heart rate is a constant measure of what's happening in the system, both externally to the person and internally to the person. 
the, the nervous system is sending all sorts of signals up, about 80% of the information going comes from the viscera, from the body. The brain doesn't have its own inputs. It's taking all of this information through the body and then it's categorizing it in the brain. And there's a particular area, well, set of areas in the brain that is categoriz categorizing our experience. And as a result of what we're feeling physically and then how we're perceiving that in the sensory centers of the brain, that then tells the nervous system what's going on and what to do, again, impacting heart rate. So if my heart rate is beating too fast, say because I'm breathing too shallow for whatever reason, even if there's no danger in my environment, my brain is going to register that as dangerous. Right, right. Something's going to, I'm going to change my perception of what's going on. So, so when, you're, you're, you're showing that bi-directional effect of the heart rate, the perception, and the feeling, and then the heart rate again. Yep. And uh, that, you know, as therapists, as we monitor activation, uh, to keep in mind that activation is going to be correlated to heart rate. Yes. So you can see that in, in the therapist chair. If somebody begins to breathe at a different rate um, and, and more shallow, maybe, you can see that start to come on board. You can see if they hold their breath, you know, oh, they've just cut off their ability for the parasympathetic here. So they're at a, a point of being more sympathetic because they're, they're, not, they're not letting that breath out. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of breathing techniques where we extend the exhale. Part of what we're doing is helping the parasympathetic nervous system be more in control in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're teaching that different experience, even through difficult activity, we're, we're teaching that experience of, ah, it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, good. Um, good. yeah, so as we, go ahead. So, so then uh, maybe it might shift to the second point of the presentation is kind of showing that mind-body organization of uh, spirit, feelings, emotions, uh, um, cognition, you know, how it all comes together. Right. Because through that heart rate piece, what ends up happening is we make a decision and we make an, uh, a judgment about what's going on both externally and internally to us. And some of that is our emotional responding. So as heart rate is showing us that if you can think about a square and in the square, we have our spiritual self, our physical self our emotional self, our mental self. And then in the middle is the heart where it's all coming together and it's all able to then be uh, processed or if you want to use the word digested or, or whatever, but we're starting to make sense of all these different parts of us. The spiritual looking at the part of us that's connected to the, the whole. So when, I, you know, when I'm doing work, I know I'm connected to the field and I can feel that rhythm and that pulsation. I can watch that happen in the breath rate, the heart rate. I can see that maybe if I'm doing movement and muscle work, armoring, all those pieces. You can see and feel that between the two people. The physical, of course, is all of those pieces that we can read and then we can manipulate. The emotional is that first line of intelligence. So the first physical sensation that comes in tells us maybe what's happening for us. And a lot of our emotions have similar somatic markers, but until I can step back and say, what is this really I'm feeling? I'm not gonna have the intelligence of understanding what to do with it. And often what happens is we have a physical sensation and then we judge it quickly and then we say it's this based on past learning and experience, but we don't get the opportunity to really study and, and, and explore what that is. Yeah. Then we jump over to the mental side where we make our second jo uh, jolt of intelligence of let me think about this, let me make a judgment about it, let me make a plan and or action about it. And then we respond as though that, that's absolute truth. But really when you think about what's coming into the body, that somatic presentation, if we slow that down, then we have an opportunity to study what is this actual feeling that's impacting our entire physical system. Yeah, and yeah. movement is a way that I do that. Yeah, so what we're talking about is that um, we tend to have shortcut. Um, we get the somatic marker and mm -hmm. we kind of get the default meaning of it and right. essentially build a whole plan of action um, on mm -hmm. something that doesn't have a very solid base. And right. what we do essentially is mindfulness, some more mindful approaches are about giving ourselves the time to pay a little bit more attention to that information and not mm -hmm. go into the default interpretation of it. 
Right. Yes. So I often use with my clients, you know, anxiety and excitement have the same somatic markers. A little tingliness. I might be breathing a little more fast or, or shallow. I might be able to see a little better. I'm a little stronger. I might have that butterflies in my stomach. I might be sweating more. I'm a little bit more alert. But if I grew up in a fearful environment, I'm going to take that as fear. If I grew up in a, in a risk-taking environment, I'm going to say, wow, we're about to do something really fun. Doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not fearful, but I'm going to perceive that experience very differently based on past judgment. So we want to slow that down and say, what's really happening here in this moment? And then that way I can use present moment in the therapy office to teach somatic awareness and intelligence so that they have a better understanding of their own system and what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. And so as we're talking about this, then maybe that's a transition to, to why movement and, um, and how movement is going to help with that and with therapy. So why movement? Because I can't sit still. <laughs> Personally, there's no way I can sit still that long. So um, I'm a very energetic, very active person. It's very hard for me and took a long time for me to learn some of the techniques of going in. And I almost always will struggle with it if I have not had some sort of movement first. Um, as I, I said, and that can be small movement, it doesn't have to be a lot, but it needs to be something that helps ground me into my physical system. And I'm a very embodied person all the time. And there's a lot of people in the world, I think, who live in their body, but don't really know how to read their body. So they are very movement oriented, or they, they are very um, kind of in the world in a big way with a physicality, but they don't really know what those markers are. They're just reacting, reacting, reacting based on past experience. So one of the, the ways that I come at it is really through that exercise science part because it is such a grounding of my foundation. And I do like the, the just to kind of throw this out there, but I do kind of like that left brainy science and math part of what are we really doing? How am I manipulating the oxygen that you're using? And what does that do in your system? And what does that really mean when I take your caloric value here and then I add this and then I add you know, this kind of intensity and what's that force and what's that velocity to me is very fun. And I like so, to- So that's what you're talking about there is um, that instead of um, in a way being in a general thing about dealing with emotion, mind, body. Um, it gives you a sense of going into the nitty gritty of it uh, yes. because we're talking about activation and we're talking about, uh, you know, the processing, the breathing, processing air, processing, you know, blood flow. Yes. Um, so there is a concrete correlate to what yes. we're doing. Because what happens is if I do movement, Movement does X in the body. Um, and it can, like, and, and make no mistake either, I often say this to people a thought, having an emotion, are also movement in the body because it changes your chemistry. The minute you have a thought or an, an emotion, it changes the physical structure of you differently. You have a neurological event that happens. You change the way the endocrine system is interpreting something or is, is sending out its signals to the rest of the endocrine system. So it's movement within the body, even if we're just sitting in the room, and I'm really truly just sitting in my chair at that moment in time. Movement does something to the body. And then when we can peg at what we want that movement to do, we can manipulate that much differently. So part of what movement does is we know exercise increases some of the feel-good hormones and neurotransmitters that people need. They need that serotonin and that dopamine. They need the endorphins and the endocannabinoids that come out as a result of different styles of movement. That helps them have a different experience of their particular place. So in my office, if I'm having them do some wall squats, um, I might have them there to a point where it's hard. It, it, they're starting to sweat and they don't want to stay there. And we're pushing through that just a little bit more because it's teaching them how to regulate themselves in that moment, as well as it might be about, you know, the particular diagnoses they have is sometimes how I pick the different movements. Sometimes it's about helping them settle in so we can actually do a more mindful set of body sensation and trying to figure out what's going on in the present moment somatically. Um, the other thing we know that happens concretely with exercise and movement is we increase brain-derived neurotropic factor. That helps with neuroplasticity in the brain. 
the hippocampus is damaged by the stress hormones, so glucocorticoids that are floating through the body. If somebody's been under chronic stress and or grew up in a system of chronic stress, their hippocampus is typically smaller. Um, and the, the research shows that those like with borderline personality, um, antisocial, that there's some correlation between the size of their hippocampus and those disorders, that their hippocampus is smaller. And, as a, and we believe it's as a result of some of those life stressors. It, the hippocampus doesn't repair itself so well, but brain-derived neurotropic factor does come in and help the hippocampus. So as we exercise, we increase that ability for the brain-derived neurotropic factor to help with the plasticity of the brain, which helps build the hippocampus, which helps them with memory and self-regulation so that they're not so labile in their emotions. So I can so push... What we're talking about is two... Uh, two effects. One is some uh, long-term effect, a corrective effect, uh, or an, a long-term improvement where mm -hmm. um, we restore uh, the functioning that yes. has been affected by dealing with stress or trauma, mm -hmm. uh, either by directly affecting the nervous system uh, or helping it build uh, its functionality. Yes. And the other is uh, something that's a learning of a different kind. That what we're talking about is we're talking about, you know, what we're pursuing in therapy is teaching people to better self-regulate. And that self-regulation, since we're embodied beings, uh, happens at the body level. And yes. so the exercise is uh, something that you use as a way to teach self-regulation in a very yes. physical way because that's where it happens. Right, right. Yes. And one of the other cool things that happens, and this was, this came out of, um, or kind of led through some of my dissertation work and research, is that, so I, I really was looking at how stress impacts the body. And specifically, I thought it was trauma that mediated the ability for people to work out. Because they would be in my office and they would say, oh, I had a panic attack. I couldn't, I couldn't exercise like you asked me to do. And I, when I was listening to their stories, I thought, that's not a panic attack. You were truly riding your bike uphill, and I live at 7,000 feet above sea level. So you really just were breathing hard, and your heart was taxed because you're not in very good shape. And it became apparent that, oh, and so I'm going to um, overlay on the window of tolerance for what we might consider with trauma – their window of tolerance for physical activity was so low and it was tipping them out into these body sensations that reminded them of past experiences like traumatic events in their life. And then they were, you know, they were reacting as though it was panic and, um, and it wasn't, it was truly just, wow, you just aren't in shape. And that's, that was a pretty big hill for you to try to climb on your bike on day two of your exercise program. So it got me thinking and then drove my research around what is it really that modulates the ability for people to engage in physical exercise. So many people with mental health issues have a lot of physical health issues. They on average die younger and they get told all the time, go work out and they don't. And so it became apparent that there was something going on. And part of what I started to see and what my research helped guide was so there, there's this window, and if we again overlay it just on kind of the ability and sensitivity to the world in the window of tolerance, they might have a very small window for their somatic ability. The, that heart rate rising to climb that hill on that bike was too much, and it tipped them out above what they were able to handle. Well, exercise can do the same because in a, in a physiology training window, I want to push that window open by having them come up as high as they can. We call that the anaerobic threshold. I want them to get to that level and sometimes go over it, but sometimes, you know, often stay high and then maybe come down and recover. And then there's different ways that I would program at the low end and the high end and then in between and fluctuating like intervals and what's really popular right now in order for them to expand that physiology window and the ability for the body to do work yeah. of any so kind. What we're talking about is that um, simply doing exercise. If you push too much mm -hmm. beyond your window of tolerance, you're going to encounter a physical activation yes. that is a similar physical uh, activation than the activation that you get you know, when there is stress, when there is fear. Yes. And 
as we talked about at the beginning, as human beings, we take a shortcut. So we experience that condition and find the meaning that comes most immediately. Right. So it's not in our experience, in our vocabulary, to associate that simply with exercise, then we're going to associate it with a panic situation right. and live it that way. And of course, it's going to have a life of its own. And then, uh, you know, the loop is going to come there. Right. And what you're doing is helping people understand the difference between the two sources of activation. Right. Because what I found in my research was those people who had more substance use disorder diagnoses. So they had the poly substance, some of them up to four substance use disorders. They were the ones who could exercise the best. And when I found out, when I said, Why, how is this? Like you guys are the ones who you would think would be having the most trouble. They're in and out of jail. They were having all sorts of problems. And they, the thing was, is a lot of them had lost their license. And so they had to walk and they had to bike everywhere. And a lot of them had been in and out of jail and continued to be in and out of jail during my research period. And qualitatively, they were able to tell me, well, there's nothing to do in jail. So I just walk or I just work out or I just whatever. And so it became apparent that not only was it exposure to the activity that was helping them lower their barriers and find the benefits, which then made it easier for them to participate. And so I started applying that information to everybody else in my therapy office. So I started saying, okay, well, if it's not trauma, and it really was panic was the one that was the most significantly correlated, was if you're having panic, you can't, you, you find more barriers and you don't participate in exercise very much. So it was, okay, well, I've got to figure out how to help you have an experience that is close to panic, but not, and that then pushed their ability to tolerate those somatic sensations, which then pushed their ability to tolerate all sorts of somatic sensations. So they could sit in group longer and not get angry at the person across the way. They could process a piece of trauma, maybe using um, a more traditional method like Hakomi, and not tip out as quickly. I, you know, I, I was easier for me as the right. therapist. But so, so what we're talking about here is that. Um, you're getting people trained, you know, there's a little, literally a training effect of a higher activation level, but instead of just arriving at this activation level, say through um, trying to remember stressful moments or, you know, as we might do in a traditional trauma therapy, uh, you can go to it through exercise, yes. uh, through that you know, in the exercise, you get that higher level of activation and you get the client to be accustomed to functioning with that higher level of activation without taking it as so much of a threat. So that when placed in a more, you know, stressful situation, they can bear, they can on that, you know, that experience of being able to tolerate that activation in order to apply that in the emotional situation. Yes. And part of that, this, so some of the science behind that is part of what exercise does. So when we're stressed, our HPA axis is elevated. As a result of that stress that's running through the body and through those neuro, um, uh, the, the neurotransmitters and the hormones that are running through the body as a result of the stressful situation, which we often see elevated in people who um, have trauma experiences in their history, that cortisol level stays elevated all the time for them. And then they have quicker spikes and, and drops than those of us who did not grow up in, in traumatic environments. So what ends up happening is that people who are under chronic stress are operating as though their whole system is running at a faster rate all the time as a result of the chemistry within the body. What exercise does is it takes that, it hits the same system because it's still stress on the body. But what it does is metabolize those those hormones and neurotransmitters. So it utilizes up some of those things that are floating through the system, and it does so in a way that teaches people safety and containment within their own physical structure. It teaches them strength. It teaches them self-confidence. It allows them to assert themselves and use their space differently so that they really can start to play around with things like proximity and ability. And can I push against this? Can I pull from this? Can I move fast? Can I run? Can I get away? All those things that maybe they couldn't have done in the past, they get to explore in something like burpees. 
And then they go through that difficult exercise. They come out of it with not only the, the physical exhaustion of it, but the, end, um, the, the endorphins that are feel good. Uh, mm -hmm. This piece, they have more contentment and serotonin. They also have used up some of the stress hormones, and over time, exercise actually makes us less sensitive to some of those um, glucocorticoids that are floating through the system, wrecking havoc on our hippocampus. And as a result, we see um, we see some changes in the way that our monocytes actually respond to the system, which in general lowers our inflammation rate. So when you think about inflammation rates in the body, because exercise is stress on the body and it creates an inflammation response. However, it also helps with that and it helps low, it helps with the glucocorticoids and the stress that might also be causing inflammation. But as a result of making us less sensitive to some of those monocytes, it actually can help us with that inflammation rate and help decrease it and or keep it a little more sustained and just make us not as sensitive to it. So Correct. when you think about disease... So, so we're, we're, we're using the energy um, mm -hmm. that's created by the fight-flight mechanism mm -hmm. um, and at the same time generating other processes that help deal better with stress. Yes. And right. so I want to shift to the fourth uh, area that we talked about and give a sense of how uh, you apply this uh, in the course of therapy. And so through an example or two. Okay. So sometimes my therapy really doesn't look that much different than probably a lot of other people's. Um, and part of that is because our culture does not have a good understanding of these connections. And it doesn't, you know, people come into the therapy room and they expect to sit and they expect to do some talking, maybe a little bit of movement. And I, I do have it on my website that I do movement-based work. And I am looking at my treadmill right now. I have a treadmill in my office as well, as, as well as some other exercise equipment. So some of it would, it truly does depend on the person and what I'm programming for. Um, so some of the big areas that I use it for is I use it for a lot of self-regulation. So things like pressure points, um, ability to teach people things about where on their own body they can apply pressure and touch. Um, sometimes I do the touching, sometimes I don't. It completely depends on the person. Um, so a lot, a lot of times I might be teaching that. Um, it just again, in general, I'm often prescribing exercise and I'm not a nutritionist, but I often talk to people about their diet, which we know affects the microbiome and the gut health of a person, which again in, impacts a lot of these systems, the stress system, the inflammation rates, et cetera. I do work pretty closely with a holistic nutritionist that I send people to, especially if I know somebody's got something off in their gut and that's contributing to their mental health problem. Um, I'm sending them to her to get some sort of a diet meal plan that they can activate and help with the hydrochloric acid and the microbiome so that that's not also contributing to some of their mental health problems. Um, so the, the getting into some more specifics is when like, so programming for depression, depression is really heavy energy. And most of us who sit with depression sometimes all day in different people, we often can feel the weight of that. And so part of depression movement starts with that really heavy, slow-based movement because I have to help them have an experience of raising their energy. If I ask them to go to a high intensity, say class, or to do something with me in here that's very high intensity, they're going to just look at me and say no. And they do. Or they, they placate me and they say, okay, sure. And then they don't do it. So... The, the, you have to meet them where they are and they've got that lethargic way of being in the room with you. So start slow. You start really slow. I often start with things like very slow squats or that wall sit I was talking about earlier. Um, I might have them doing just isometric holds, which is just holding a position, not moving any muscle at the moment, but to see, just to tax out and to exhaust that muscle so that they can really experience just the holding with some strength, possibly in a movement pattern that might be difficult, so some self-confidence. And then we might begin to move at a faster pace, um, bringing the arms up. And anytime you move your arms or legs further away from the torso, you're going to raise your heart rate. So I can have them utilize what in exercise science is called the lever system, arms and legs. 
and I can have them operate those at bigger and further distances. And at that point, I'm going to raise their heart rate, which raises their breathing rate, which is going to bring their energy up. And right. so, as so we're starting with that sense that uh, the person who is in the midst of depression is going to be heavy and uh you know not moving or moving in a very ponderous way yeah and that there's no way from that place uh they're going to be either able or willing to mm -hmm. go to fast movement so right. that's a question of you what you described is progressively taking them from where they are uh to increasing the energy of the movement Yes, and if anger is part of their depression, I almost always have them doing something with their head upside down. So, because I can get the blood back into the brain and chill them out a little bit. So, there's a pressure point up here that can be really helpful. Sometimes, seriously, that really just looks like the person putting their hand on their head like this. Um, it might be that I have them on their hands and knees and they can put their head on the ground like we might see in yoga, say in, in rabbit pose or something. I, um, I have some stools in my office as well, so sometimes I have them using those. It just really depends on where, the physicality of the person and what they can do. So that anger is really assisted when we flip your perspective. And so you have to, uh, and, that, and two, when you get upside down, it's really hard for you to keep thinking about the same thing. And so it's, you flip that perspective and now they have a, a little cooling off period. Sometimes it's really just for 30 seconds, a couple of breaths, and then I have them come back up. Sometimes it's the homework that I assign. Like, hey, I want you to go home and once a day I want you to do this for 10 breaths, where I'm also teaching them diaphragmatic breathing as well. Because when you're upside down in some of those positions, especially um, like say I have them in something similar to child's pose, but you're gonna have to breathe more into your back and that breathing into the back um, in yoga philosophy, you know, we're going to say, oh, that's breathing into the unknown, into the unseen, but it's also breathing into your parasympathetic nervous system. So it's allowing us to use the back of the diaphragm and the kidney, um, that little bit of massage that the kidneys get to slow down this, the nervous system and to allow the parasympathetic nervous system to come online too. So it kind of chills them out. So if it's, if there's, you've got to meet them where they are. And then sometimes I throw in those little pieces too and say, Oh, well, okay, we did 10 squats. Now we're going to, you know, now we're going to take a, a stretch. Mm -hmm. And really I've got some pressure points that I'm utilizing as well as some breathing that I'm, I'm teaching in that moment without telling them uh, sometimes I shouldn't say that not everybody is, you know, it's not an all or nothing. And, um, and some of my clients are absolutely want to know everything that I'm doing. Some of them look at me and say, I'm not doing any of those breathing exercises. Oh, well then let's get in child's pose and put some pressure here and here's why. And then I just have them do the breathing exercise without them knowing. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And so and that's, they, how, that's how you tinker with that, that energy. Right. Well, yeah. Yes. Right. And so, yeah. And, it, and then later, of course, t talking to them about, you know, when we were in that and you know how you told me you felt, because often some of the differences of what you, what I do in the office versus what I would do, say, on the fitness center floor um, is in the office, there's periods of check in. So we might do an exercise and we're going to check in. What do you notice? What's different? Um, what were your thoughts that you had? Depending on the exercise piece that I'm doing, I'm going to have them be checking in in between different things, which is also a period of time for me to teach them about what we just did for integration so that it doesn't just feel magical, that they, mm -hmm. they actually have an understanding of why I'm asking them to do these things and why they need to do it outside of the therapy room too. Good, good. So maybe as we talked about the slowing down of depression, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to give a sense of the range, do you want to talk a little bit about what you would do with people who have anxiety? Yes. So anxiety is, right, other buzzy end. So these folks, um, again, kind of depending on their physicality, but I'm going to be meeting them with much more energy. But depending on the person, so sometimes anxiety is going to have a buzziness to it that you, the therapist, can feel, and you know it when it comes in. Um, sometimes it feels pretty disorganized, sometimes not. So if it's a disorganized piece, I'm going to have to make sure that my movement somehow matches some of that chaos. And so often with anxiety, either way, I'm meeting them with something high intensity and I'm having them do things that are both all sorts of curling up. 
so that their system feels safe and that they can get small and then we do then we get big and so I can go back and forth and uh, with trauma I often oscillate between the two we're gonna do something that's maybe slow and controlled and curled up and very safe and then we might do something that's very powerful and strong and big um, and I do anxiety often looks very similar what I find with anxious people is that they struggle they often can struggle to stay in the movement they get exhausted very quickly and that's because their nervous system is already running on high and they're already feeling really overwhelmed so to ask them to do too much work for too long at the high end they, they just exhaust out so quickly so we're we're I'm modulating between that high end and then slower smaller movements and then that high end and often with fear based um, folks where they're really just fearful of, of life or themselves or, or whatever I often am having them do movements that take up a lot of space and or require um, them to open up through the chest and that viscera so that they kind of project themselves out to some degree so we're talking about um, taking space um, if it's trauma well not just trauma but a lot of times boundaries are an issue for people so we're, we're looking at different boundary sets um, and being able to push the boundaries of the space that I'm in so that their proprioception um, and their exoception of knowing where they are and how they can move out from the torso really becomes something powerful that they can utilize all the time in yeah. a meeting at work with their spouse, partner, with their kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so again, that sense of taking people where they are. And so it can be, you know, taking them from a place of chaos Mm -hmm. uh, and and in uh, starting there, yeah. um, but also the sense of while expanding uh, to really do that in a way that feels safe by coming back to the crouching to the you know getting very small because yeah. in that uh, retrenching is safety yeah. um, and then exploring that sense of expanding. And the expanding is not just a question of, say, opening the arms, but feeling the opening of the torso, feeling yep. that, uh, that expanding that comes from inside. Right. And part of what happens there is, so in, a, in um, say, in, in body psychotherapy, we often are watching the places or can see the places where the person can't move anymore. Their energy is stuck. Well, when we're training for physicality, I'm looking at push, I'm looking at pull, I'm looking at rotation, and I'm looking often at ex like power or what we would call, you know, kind of explosive movements. So of those push, pull, and rotation especially, I'm looking at different planes of movement. That's very similar in body psychotherapy where we're looking at the push of energy, the pull of energy. Where does the energy stop? Where does the person stop rotating? Where do they stop orienting to their world so that we can actually use the movement and the exercise to help them expand into those areas where they've armored um, and become really tight mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and or numb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as we're coming to the end, does it feel like a good place to end or is there something you would want to, to add? Um, I think it's probably a good place to end. I would like to touch on a little bit about just some of the somatic countertransference and how you can use that. Mm -hmm. So um, part of the, the movement base is that you're creating electrical chemical little patterns within us, right? We're just electrical chemical little beings. And as a result, that, that information comes into the field. So while I'm working with someone, if I can stay open and I can stay mindful, which can be difficult, but especially if you're doing a lot of movement, but if I can stay in that place of receptivity, there's hits that I will get through that morphic field of what might be going on or what might be stuck or what might be needed. And I can, at that point, either change my breath rate, which is going to change, if they trust me, their breath rate, which is going to change their heart rate, which is going to impact their nervous system. I can make a slight adjustment to a movement. Say I'm noticing, I might be noticing a part of me. Um, I use the feet a lot because the feet are so, so powerful. And there's not a lot of big movement that you have to do with them to get all the way in through the torso of the body. And it's very non-invasive for people. So if I'm noticing like, wow, I can see their, their foot collapsing in and that 
the arch isn't where I want it to be. And as a result, somatically, I can, oh, like, I can feel a bit of a numbness you know, on, on this hip or through this right side using that mindful-based place. I can then speak to that and say, is there, you know, is there something going on here? What do you feel there? Or, you know, I want you to feel your arch. What do you notice? And I can start directing some of that movement and that perception into the physicality, which then allows some opening of the psychology. So, and again, very non-invasively. So just to, to use the foot again. So the arch of the foot, if I have somebody pull up on the arch of their foot, it comes up the midline of the leg all the way into the hip and into the pelvic floor. So again, I'm impacting into the nervous system just by having them clench their toes maybe or grab a ball or a towel um, or even just put a pencil underneath the arch of their foot. And some of those really small movements that you might actually see more like in a uh, uh, physical therapy office in rehab become really, really powerful movements that you use to express our psychology and to give people a different experience of their body. And so now, now they have this experience of the pelvic floor where they may have been numb before. And as a result, now we may have a processing piece of emotion that may come out or some thoughts that may come out or something that then happens that we can shift. And, and when we're in that place of that resonance with other people and we really use our own body as the tool and as the instrument, it becomes very... Um, there's a synergy there and often many people have never been met in that kind of relationship um, and that and I think most of us somatic psychologists would say oh that's a lot of what we're doing we're meeting that attunement and attachment and we talk a lot about that we talk a lot about right brain to right brain connectivity um, but there's a lot of therapists who don't so people coming into our our offices aren't always knowing that some of that is what's actually doing the healing is the fact that I noticed you were breathing too hard for what we're really doing here. And I took a deep breath and you followed me. So your parasympathetic nervous system came on board and said, ah, see, we're safe. We can go a little bit more. So or, I want to maybe suggest you might want to just repeat that last part a little slowly because in that, you know, so what you, you were talking about is that sense of, uh, you know, uh, very concrete way of meeting somebody and the experience of meeting them. And mm -hmm. so they, um, you know, you're noticing that the client is breathing, you know, it's kind of holding their breath. Yes. And uh, go ahead. Let me pick up. So, yeah, so you're, you're doing something with them. And again, it might truly just be sitting with them, but um, but say I'm having them do something. And as a result, I'm noticing, Oh man, they're, they're really shallow in their breathing. And, and I'm getting a sense, and I think those of us who, who work a lot with that somatic realm of, of resonance, we get hits all the time of what might be going on in the other person. And many of our modalities in somatic psychology, we're going to label that. We're going we're gonna to say something about that in order to bring that overt awareness in. So same thing. I might notice while they're really breathing in a, in a way that I don't think is, is helpful for this particular movement pattern. And I know they have the capacity for something a little different. That's, that's an important piece. So I'm going to take a, a deep breath myself and I'm going to watch to see if their body matches me. And often it will if they trust me. And so as a result, now they're maybe doing something very difficult. Again, I'll use my wall squat example because it's usually really difficult and people complain. And so they're up against the wall. I can tell they're sweating. Their muscles are starting to shake. They're starting to breathe more shallow. They're starting to move towards that high level of their window. I can take a deep breath and say, wow, this is really hard. And, and they match me often. And then they can stay in that experience a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So that, that attunement and that, that piece of I'm here with you and you're not alone and I kind of feel what's going on for you is speaking to the subconscious mind by overtly labeling, wow, this is really hard. Or is that part numb? Like, I'm not sure I can feel that inner thigh. Like, what? Is that happening for you? And then they, they're able to repeat back to me yes or no and either, again, get, you know, get more specific or they go, yeah, yeah, yeah it is. And so what we're talking about is this is within the context, not just of talking, you know, the, the therapy that we would do, but something that where you are specifically working with a client physically and um, they are 
pushing beyond the comfort zone in order to do something that is physically more challenging. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a, a particular exercise technique that I over, I, it's called Tabata, very difficult, very structured. It's four minutes long. At the end of the four minutes, you, it's hard, very hard. By about round six, we're down to core beliefs and we're down to reprogramming and giving them a different, different way of languaging themselves, both physically and knowing themselves, um, thought-based, um, emotionally all through both the physical nature of the work and then my attunement to them. Um, often, I, I am most trained in Hakomi, so I use a lot of Hakomi work, um, using some of those character structures and core belief structures that come out of Hakomi to overlay onto locomotor development and movement patterns while in mindfulness with them, while they're doing four minutes of very intense, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, of repetitive work. Great. Great. Yeah. They usually get pretty angry about round six, round seven, we've got a new program and round eight, they go, I don't know why that was such a big deal. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey.